Hi, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today I'm going to be talking about line balancing. This video was requested by Martin Jacobo. So thanks Martin. If anyone else has an idea for a video, feel free to leave it in the comments. What is line balancing? Line balancing is balancing the times and output of each operator, machine, or even whole production cell to produce goods as fast as possible while maintaining quality. That's huge. Sometimes when you rush in operations, you lose quality. But as long as you can meet your quality standards and improve the speeds, things are going well. And you do this by balancing all the different parts involved in production. All right, so what is a line? A line can be an assembly line, a production line, an advanced composite assembly cell, or even a flow of service outside the manufacturing space. So people at fast food restaurants, they have to balance their lines too, or you're going to wait on your food longer than you should. Really, line balancing isn't a specific subject because it involves so many different disciplines coming together to improve something. Time studies, work sampling, work instruction creation, even things like purchasing, shipping, leadership, operations, all sorts of different things are involved. But I'll highlight some examples of how you can improve a line and make it balance. I think to understand why lines need balanced, you first have to realize why lines become unbalanced. So let's start with a basic example. Let's look at a PB&J, a good old peanut butter and jelly sandwich, one of my favorite sandwiches. Let's pretend we have a production line that makes PB&Js. Let's say there's five basic steps required to make the finished good. Pull two slices of bread out of the bag. Put jelly on one slice. Put peanut butter on the other. Put the pieces of bread together. And then put the sandwich into some sort of container. Okay, that's simple enough. Hopefully you've made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before. But how would you build a production line to do this? Well, let's be linear about it. Let's have a station and person for each of the five steps. We'll have a bread puller station, a jelly technician, a peanut butter technician, a sandwich assembler, and a packaging associate. We have our basic production line. How long do you think it will take the bread puller to pull two slices of bread from the package? Let's say five seconds. How long does it take to put jelly on a sandwich? Probably a little longer than it would take to pull two slices of bread out of a bread package, so let's say 10 seconds. Putting peanut butter on the other slice probably takes a little bit longer, just because you really want to make sure you spread that thick peanut butter around. So let's say 12 seconds for that. Assembling the sandwich, let's say 10 seconds because you really want to make sure it's square and you're not dripping jelly out the sides of your sandwich. Packaging's probably quick, maybe not as quick as pulling the bread, so let's say 7 seconds for that. Pretty straightforward, right? But what's the problem here? If we have five full-time people making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and each person takes this long for their step, we're going to have some people doing their task way more often than other people, or waiting on the person before them. So let's see how this works when we apply some math to it. How long would it take to make a sandwich? Well, you have to add together everyone's time. And when you do that, you get 44 seconds. That's the labor required to make a sandwich. So with five people, we should just divide 44 seconds by five to get 8.8 .8 seconds per sandwich. Because we have five people working together, right? Well, if things were 100% efficient, sure, this math would hold up. But if you look at the line above, you start to see some of the problems I was discussing earlier. So with the exact setup above, how long does it take you to get a sandwich? That's right, 12 seconds. Because no matter how fast everyone else is, the peanut butter technician is the slowest operator. They are the bottleneck, a symptom of inefficiency. So to understand what this bottleneck would cause, what this inefficiency would cause, let's watch what would happen if every station could just run continuously as if somehow everyone magically got what they needed and could work their heart out. Let's say the line runs for 10 minutes, or 600 seconds. The bread puller could pull enough bread for 120 sandwiches. The jelly technician could spread enough jelly for 60 sandwiches. The peanut butter technician could put enough peanut butter for 50 sandwiches. Now remember, that's our bottleneck. The sandwich assembler could assemble 60 sandwiches. And the packaging associate could package roughly 85 sandwiches. 
but could the assembler and packager meet their full potential? In reality, who's providing what they need to do their jobs? That's right, the person before them. And because the peanut butter technician is the bottleneck, they're only handing out a semi-completed sandwich every 12 seconds. So the sandwich assembler, even though they can do their job in 10 seconds, they have two seconds of downtime where they are just standing there, staring at the peanut butter technician, waiting for their sandwich. Now, two seconds doesn't seem like a lot of time, but it adds up quick. And you may not hear the sandwich assembler complain about it, and you may not even notice this downtime looking at it, but when you do a time study or a work sample study, you'll notice it. So for this basic example, what are some improvements we could put into place? Considering the fact that we just discussed our bottleneck occurred because we had five different people each performing their own task that took a different amount of time. So I think one of the first improvements you might think of is, well, let's have five people, but each person does every single task. That way, they're never waiting on someone before them. They're doing each task themselves. This would ensure a sandwich comes out every 44 seconds, right? Because we know all the tasks added up to 44 seconds. Well, not exactly. There might be walking between the stations for each person. If a person is doing everything themselves, they may have to pick up a butter knife, put it back down, pick up a container, put it back down, and sure, for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you might be able to do these pretty quick and with ease. But as you get into more and more complex manufacturing, these transitions take time, skill, and training, and they add up. So with that logic, let's assume someone who has to make a PB&J isn't naturally skilled at all the steps, and it takes time to switch between tools and different steps. So what are some other improvements, some other tools or setups we could give them to improve their times? Well, using tools like 5S, operator interviews, and basic mechanical engineering concepts, you really can add tools and design the workstation to best suit the operator. Here's some basic ideas. Buy bread in bulk, and have the operator partially dump it on a slide to easily grab pieces. That way they're not reaching into a bag to grab two pieces, and then opening a new bag every time they're done with a single loaf. Pretty basic, but it would make a difference. Switch to squeeze bottles of jelly so that the operator can easily squirt jelly onto bread. I use these at home because it's a pain to get a butter knife into a jelly jar sometimes. A squeeze jar is faster. Even if it's more expensive, the labor cost you save might make up for it. Switch to a creamier type of peanut butter so it is easy to spread. Obviously in the manufacturing world you have agreed upon contracts and designs, but for the next version of the product, you can actually take things back to the design engineers and the product team and your sales department to see if, hey, can we change this product slightly to make it easier to manufacture? Or how about even a giant hinge that will let you push 10 sandwich halves together at once? Sometimes crazy ideas like that are a great starting point for design discussions. I think it's time we go into a more realistic example. And even saying a realistic example, there's only so much you can go into. In the world of manufacturing, there's so many different machines, so many different manufacturing processes, and so many different ways to combine them. But as you become a process engineer, or an engineer involved in manufacturing, you'll really begin to see things as chunks of time and process flows. You'll get to a point where it really doesn't matter as much what the machine is or what the process is, as long as you know the time, how it flows, who can do it, and the time needed to make a part. You'll begin to see things as pieces that fit together. So in this example, let's pretend we have a press, a weld station, a CNC lathe, a clean station, and a packaging associate. Most of these machines have doubles, but there's only five workers working between machines to produce the same part over an eight-hour shift. Each operator has their own task, as lettered and colored. Each task takes a different amount of time, and all tasks of that station must be completed before the operator can hand their part to the next operator. So what would be a good first step to improve this cell in real life? Well, you could use time studies to reassign work. This is probably the core function of many process engineers. Each of those tasks I listed out has a time associated with it. And by doing a time study for several hours, or however long it takes to get a good average for each task, you can begin to understand how long each operator should take to do their job. 
And unlike with the PB and J, where we consider each person to only have one task, each person in this line has multiple tasks. So by reassigning different tasks, you can make each operator take roughly the same amount of time. Or at least you can decrease that bottleneck time. Remember how the time of the bottleneck is the maximum production you can possibly make. Because even if everyone else is quicker, that person takes the longest, so everyone is going to wait on them. And by decreasing the time of the bottleneck, as long as you're not making another person the bottleneck, you're going to get more parts out every single hour. Because that maximum output time has decreased. Less time to make a part, more parts per hour. But back to our original tasks for each operator. You could have the packaging associate be a floater. Sometimes you can't reassign tasks. On paper, each operator takes roughly the same amount of time, and reassigning tasks would only create new bottlenecks. But there are many scenarios where one of those operators may have large amounts of downtime between their jobs, or they just have the lowest average. In this case, depending on what the other tasks are, you can have that person float, that is, move over to other stations and help out other operators with simple tasks. Positioning tools, cleaning something off, pressing a button, and in this way, the floater picks up the slack of other workers. Another way to improve the cell, and you're starting to see this more and more, is automation. It really is something you can't fight. Let's say the operator controlling the CNC lathe was mostly pressing buttons and loading parts. By putting a basic robotic arm into the station, or having some sort of slide that would position the parts, and then have an automated CNC program run on its own with a few sensors, we can replace one operator, making the cell more efficient and reducing your labor. My only note to add to this is that a good company won't fire the person that is replaced with automation. They'll find another job for that person to improve the company. Now we all know that unfortunately, this isn't always the case. But if you're an engineer involved in automating someone's job, really, really try to give that person a new job as best as you can. Of course you want everyone to be employed, and part of that can be up to you. I'll end on a few other items to consider. Oftentimes you can have a line lead, that is someone who controls the operators on the line, stick around to prevent performance slack. You often see this in many manufacturing facilities. You'll designate one person on the line, someone who's been there the longest or has the best skill, and you'll promote them to line lead. You'll pay them a little bit more and you'll give them authority over the others. This will help prevent slack. You can improve change over times, so that's something not even related to the operations themselves, but rather how long it takes to change different tools out or to even rearrange the cell for different parts. The quicker you can get to your work, the better your work is going to be. Consider work sample studies and operator interviews to understand why employees are not working to full capacity. Are they frustrated with something? Is there something preventing them from working at their best? Is there a reason they think they're working at their best and they are not? Work sample studies and operator interviews will really help you get down to some of these core reasons. And if you can understand the root cause, you may be able to change it. This next point is one of my favorites, and I think it's very valuable in almost every process. Involve employees in the redesign process. As a good process engineer, you will study what the operators are doing. You will talk to them. You will measure their results. You will measure their inputs. You'll learn what they're doing, but you'll never know it as well as they do. If you get them involved in the redesign process or ways to improve their own jobs, you'd be surprised how often that little bit of buy-in will really make a difference. They may identify something that you never thought of. And finally, if you have a contract for a large volume of parts or you're in an environment where you can batch process, that is, run many parts through the same machine or the same process at once, it may be worth it because you can gain small efficiencies and reduce transportation and set up waste. Thank you so much for watching this beginning engineer's video. I hope you now understand why line balancing really involves multiple disciplines, and it's not something you can just figure out in an hour. But as you try different approaches and really study what you are trying to fix, I believe you can be successful. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe. Have a great day.